Okay, this is uh, August uh, 31st, 1997. We are in Lebanon, Ohio. The interviewee is Lawrence H. Meyer, being interviewed by Dr. Vernell Williams, the History Department at Abilene Christian University. Mr. Meyer, if you would uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your parents, your family, where you grew up, and who your parents were. My grandfather came to this country from Switzerland in the time of about the Civil War. He married a girl of uh, English descent, and they came to. He came before he was married to this country uh, as wrong. That, that isn't right at all. I, it's my good. That's okay. Okay. You just pick up where you want to. Yeah. Start over. My grandfather came to this country from Switzerland when he was 16 years old. He and his mother came, his father already been here. They settled eventually in Ohio and then came on to Indiana. And my grandfather has six boys and two girls. They all lived in basically in northern Indiana for I, I was born in Fulton County, Indiana, which is halfway between South Bend and Indianapolis. Uh, what did your parents uh, do for a living? My mother was a housewife. My father was a, he would say a farmer, although he made a other things too. And he, what do you remember about uh, the 20s and the 30s growing up? Uh, what what are your impressions about those days? What uh, uh, <clears throat> what was your life like? What your what, what was your home like? Uh, school that kind of thing. Any memories? We, we had a small home. I started a school in a one room brick schoolhouse. Uh, I probably would have gone. I went in. There two years, probably would have been more, but a tornado came through and took the building out. So then I moved and went the other direction in the town, the town of Fulton, where there was a school. Actually, we were halfway between 
and uh, the trustees always had a uh, little hassle about who's going to pay for them this time because somebody had to pay for it. I graduated from Fulton High School in 1926 and went to had no thought at all of going on to school because they just didn't do it. One of the latter days of school, the principal asked me if I wanted to apply for a scholarship. And I no. But he told me that he had just received a notice of one that was, sounded pretty good to him. So we applied to DePaul University to the Rector Scholarship. Uh, that was a very generous scholarship that paid all fees. That's all it paid. Uh, all fees when I got there were $94 a semester, which is somewhat changed present time. Uh, graduated from DePaul University in 1930 with a degree in mathematics and physics. What's that? What did you do following graduation? Graduation was in 1930 and you know what the money situation was in those days. I I had been working for a, <coughs> for a little confectionery restaurant three years, four years, and we stayed on a, I don't know, a few days after commencement of the last time. And the owner of the place showed up with a lawyer one day and said, do you want to buy this place? Uh, I had probably 30 cents in my pocket, but I bought it on nothing down, and I forget how once a month the payment was, not very much. And we ran that little confectionery until I got a teaching job back at Fulton School. That was in about I Were you married at this time? No. So did uh, you, you run the store by yourself? Well, I had a brother help, and she helped because, uh, well, I was married before they, before they married in 32, and didn't uh, get the teaching job just 
33 in the ball. So they were a lot sooner. But I was married in 32. We just, uh, Nineteen thirty-two, we just celebrated the anniversary in June. Yeah. Well, after after you went back to Fulton School, how long did you stay there? I stayed there until it was nineteen forty, and everybody was itchy about. Are we going to get in the war? And, uh, uh, kind of upset. And I had told the principal, because I was still was in the reserve, I told him what's likely to happen. And so one morning, I always stopped at the post office and picked up the mail as I walked past going to school. And I found the letter. And when I got to school, I told the principal I showed it to him. And he said he didn't know how he was going to get along with me. But I told him I'd stay a week. I think they gave me two weeks. I was to report on February 3rd. And I think they held you know, that up. Right. On February 12th, uh, I guess it was a day or two before I had a report. We loaded everything we owned in the car and took off for Fort Knox for I was to report. Uh, this was the 12th. We got Louisville I had to get to uh, get uh, a motel hotel room and okay. So we went over to the thirteenth which we did. It was a little inconvenient because uh, they had this was some sort of holiday. Twelfth. Well, that was before the politicians. That was uh, Lincoln's birthday. Was a holiday, and Washington had a holiday. And, uh, so it was a little difficult to cash checks and do things like that. Well, tell, tell me, uh, how did you get in the reserves? Was that at the university? Did you get involved in yeah. that? Yeah. University had man mandatory uh, ROTC for two years, which was not, well, I think it was a three, two hour course. You met. So you were commissioned into the reserves, but not on active duty when right. you graduated. Right. So when you were called to active duty, were you, uh, you called up uh, what in the rank of uh, second lieutenant? Oh, by that time I was wearing two bars. So you were a captain. I promised uh, some of the. Well, all the promotions here on the time schedule plus uh, plus uh, active duty. 
had two weeks active duty, each odd number year, that's 31, 33, 35, 37, 39, things were looking a little upsetting. Nine, we had an extra period of active duty. So we had a total of seven weeks. Uh, three, three or four, probably four weeks of it was spent in Louisiana maneuver. First time they ever had maneuver. Louisiana. We went into the raw bayou and uh, mosquitoes and all. And, and, uh, that maneuver. And then the, in the fall, they had three weeks at the uh, Fort McCoy. And that's about. Uh, But what it was, then we did a lot of homework, uh, correspondence course, a lot of it. Uh, now, is this all during the reserve years or is this after, yeah. after active duty? Yeah. You had active duty on those odd numbers here, two weeks I see. each. And that might be anything. One year was weapons training and we we were the infantry weapons at that time they have different things. Well when you got to Fort Knox to report in, what did you do with your wife? Did you have a family by then? Did you uh, rent an apartment? What did you do? We rented a little at that time was overrun, you know, say, with people working in the construction of Fort Knox. They were putting up buildings out there like popcorn and they were full. So but we found one hotel room in the Kentucky Hotel that we could get. We spent, I mean, we stayed there the first night, and in the meantime, we found a, an apartment on Virginia Avenue that we moved to before I went out to folks. What, uh, what happened when you reported in? What do you remember about that? Well, to show a little about how it was moving, we were, <coughs> I was told in the barracks, so, uh, there's her to report. So I wonder whether there were a bunch of officers now around. And, uh, they didn't seem to know much more about it than I did. And, uh, but we got sorted out. It turned out that was the headquarters of the Armored Force Replacement Training Center, which hadn't been organized yet. Or, I mean, it was just in the forming stages. And they. Uh, work, uh, setting it all up. The idea was very good that because in those days, instead of, you didn't have an individual trained as a tanker or armored 
personnel as you would now. Please. Would try to train take her we train motorcycle scouts and all specialists. The idea was that you train this this one big company and they can all drive a tank. But they can't drive anything else because they don't need any other training. So that got wiped off. But it was organized in three groups, uh, training groups of uh, and about three battalions apiece, I think. It was just administrative to handle the training. And then that that progressed and became more modern until it was let's see. Finally in in on the Early July, first or second, simply about that, I heard a rumor, or rather, one of the friends of mine was G1, or Adjutant General, I'm not sure which he was, but he had access to incoming orders so on. He said, you're, you're going to leave here. Uh, I said, where's the orders? And we had a, a weekend situation there about the holiday, just like it is now. They had a long holiday. And I knew I couldn't, they, they wouldn't uh, do anything to involve that. So, I didn't get any information. And they would tell me, somebody said, they, uh, I saw the order, and uh, but they didn't uh, couldn't find it. So on Saturday, I still hadn't got any order. I went up to the headquarters of the group, and the. Commander group was Thompson Lawrence, who later commanded the 100th Division of Combat. Uh, he was working at his desk, and uh, all this was still just a big barn, I think. And as was customary with him, Hey, what are you doing up here? I was trying to find out whether I'm going someplace else or whether I'm not going somewhere else. And he said, let me try. Well, he called for headquarters where they issued the order and uh, got the typical reply. They had a Sergeant on duty for the weekend, somebody that didn't have a place to go, 
that. He, he looked around and after a couple of phone calls, he said he found a, an order for a major Meyer to go to school. And I said, well, I'd like to see the on a promotion, so rather than that, let's talk about it. And after a, still a very short time, they, they called back. I was in the the next morning, I guess. Uh, on the top level, it has got to the group commander. He talked to what then was Colonel Lawrence. Well, by that time he was a general. He just just been promoted, and he said, well, "Is there a promotion in it for him?" I was a senior captain on Fort Knox, and we had porters on the post. And, all that. and apparently they said, yes, there was a promotion. So I guess went down to the same sergeant and they used the old memory rare trick of sealing out the word. Captain, uh, I mean major, but captain in, and because that got me. In. This was Saturday afternoon. The order called. I've still got it. Is it? I don't think it's here. So, oh, you guys. Uh, call for. Uh, me to be not in that order, but to be taken out of authority for having post facilities that is quartered on a post. In other words, it means get out. And Proceed by train and so on. And to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he will enter a course of instruction, the completion of which at the completion of which he will proceed to Camp Cannibal, Tennessee, and report to the 12th Armored Division on activation. That one mouthful for one order. It was over a half page. But I went home through a few things in a suitcase and we went down to the railroad station, got a ticket signed for, and took off for Leavenworth. We got on, I think we got in Leavenworth. Monday morning. Anyway, we found out then when we got there, we were, the course of instruction was to be the staffs of new division. Somebody had the idea, which wasn't too bad, that if you're going to organize a new division, 
you get the people who are going to be appointed to staff positions together and and teach them as a unit, which we did. And, uh, and from when this, when I went to Tennessee afterwards. Well, we're, when you were at Fort Leavenworth, uh, were uh, many of your classmates, uh, eventually the men who you worked with in, in uh, the staff positions in the 12th Armored and went into combat with? Well, of course, in the South, combat, uh, things change very rapidly. But yes, yeah, the same. Could you name some of the any of uh, any of these officers that uh, stayed with you for some time that you first encountered at Fort Leavenworth? That is that picture. I got a picture of the class. Oh, good. I think, but whether it's this class, I'm not not sure. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll just photocopy it or uh, get the list. So uh, we'll attach this list to the interview. This is wonderful. Uh, this is the 6th New Divisions course, July 1942, 12th Armored Division. Has a list of names and a photograph. Okay, after you've gone through the uh, course, uh, you move on to Camp Campbell, is that correct? That's right. It was, it was then when it, we were there for the opening of, of uh, Camp Camel. It was put together, well, they tried to synchronize it, and it didn't quite work, but there's a picture in there for the staff, our division, and you know, all of it, there was of it. So far, it was some cadre people in various spots, but not any great number of people have been assigned yet. What was your first impression of General Brewer? General Brewer was an artilleryman. He didn't much let anybody forget it. Uh, he used to keep a card file on his desk. His aide told me this. I didn't get that close. But he kept a card file with specific data about such things as What's the maximum range of a 75 millimeter howitzer of the And he liked to go around and call somebody over and hit them with something like that, which they were practically the, But it did get people to listen to manual. So it wasn't bad. He was not, I think, as tough as people thought he was, but in my opinion, he was at least as good as many of his Charlie Clayton was one of them. He's the one who told me about the. Uh, uh, General. Uh, 
Yeah. I don't know, let's see. You change generals on there a little later. A little later, General Camp was, had a combat command. General Peckham had a combat command. All for periods of time when they drop off there. Uh, what uh, were your duties when you arrived uh, after activation day, once training gets started, what, uh, what were your duties? Well, my, my assignment was G3, uh, plans training. Uh, there were three of us, I think I'm right, three or four signed at that capacity and we just supervised training mainly and wrote the training orders and uh, kept the thing going. Could you describe what kind of training went on uh, at Cam Campbell before you went on the Tennessee maneuvers while you were still at Camp Campbell? What were the typical types of training that uh, uh, you were involved in, in terms of uh, uh, being a staff officer? Well, by the time we got to Camp Campbell, it was all different. I don't know what because then training was by units, and I didn't, unfortunately, ever get out too much to the units. Uh, I, I was uh, circulating, but not in an advisory or command. It was a matter of needling a little bit, you know. So my, uh, incidentally, when, when the post was back on the 15th of the September, was it? Yes. When the uh, post was, I was appointed temporarily as aide to general, aide to you know, Kimmel, the grandson of the man for whom I was named. And uh, I had to escort them around. So, Camp Campbell was, at that time camp, was unusual in the fact that that was built, every stick of lumber in it, specifically for one uh, armored division. The, bu the buildings were even the right size. If you had a company of so many men, you get a living space for that many. You didn't have to double stack them or all that stuff. However, that didn't last very long. Before very long, we had two divisions in there. Was the, that the 20th Division? That's right. The 20th Division was General uh, That's one of the words I lost. What can you tell me about something called the Hellcat Camp? Do you remember anything about that? Yeah, it was a... I, too much. But during the latter stages of training, in an area 
off. I don't know which direction it was. I had a driver who was an Appalachian. He couldn't do very much mentally, but he could take that jeep and get back home from where he was. I never worried about getting lost out in the Texas prairie or something. Anyway, that's it. Yes. That's kind of hazy, huh? Well, were you out in the field during El Cap Camp, or were you back uh, at uh, Campbell? Well, well, mostly back at camp. The camp was for a group, a large number could be sent out in this area where you had, you had free fire so, so you could use ball ammunition and you lived in tents out there and stuff. did the problems, the night problems, the day problems. And it was an intensive event, but a pretty tough course, I understand. In fact, I know it was from watching it, but I didn't. What did you do uh, with the division once the division leaves Camp Campbell and goes into Tennessee on the Tennessee maneuvers? What were your duties then? Well, I went with them. We had a, we maintained the G3 section and tents. We tend to lap over a little bit. I, I was by this time in a, in a, in a division as opposed to What had been plans and operations in the replacement training center when you made it, organized the division? The G3 section consisted of a G3 lieutenant colonel. Uh, a major, or me, and a captain. Uh, three. And just when we switched, well, we went to Tennessee Maneuver in that formation. Didn't have all the people, but. And we were, we worked out, you know, problem. You know, one private war that lasted uh, usually about to Thursday, maybe you know, to maybe a day shorter. And at which time they we put out an order to assemble problems and all put them on an assembly area for the weekend and the officers all reported to Lebanon High School for a critique of the problem. And the next week you get a new, new problem. 
I think they did that for six weeks. I'm not sure how many weeks. But what about reorganization? What do you know about that? Going from the regimental structure when the division was uh, reorganized into uh, a battalion oriented uh, structure. When did that happen? That happened uh, hmm. while you were in Tennessee? Kind of, as I remember. Kind of a little of both. Uh, there were orders being passed and people moving. But it was at the close of Tennessee maneuvers, it was effective. Definitely by that time. Did that uh, reorganization have any impact on your job? Yes, because. When you, the three section now, under the new, under the new one as we had then, was a lieutenant colonel of the G3. Uh, a G3 heir, who was me, period. And that is hard to track because the, the story I just gave you I mean, was uh, didn't happen all at once. I mean, like the, I got. There was a officer from Virginia that, uh, that apparently wanted, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but he was several, he was Provo Marshal and he was uh, Headquarters Company Commander and three or four different things before he got him jockeyed around so they could promote him into, into the G3 air, which sounded like a good thing because he, he knew about aircraft and that sort of thing. At the same time, I had, I had been going to a combat command because they had no place for him. Majors at that point, there was no vacancy. And in the combat command, I they kept moving the commanders there so that uh, he. You want to rest a minute? Yeah. All right, a minute. Okay. They, uh, change these officers fast enough. I don't know exactly. What happened to who? And I get one of the guys that, well, he was in I was kind of command exec by virtue of the fact. They'd move somebody in as, as commander, come back to land, and then move out 
and it, that leaves the executive office. So they don't correct it. They don't try to put somebody in there because it would have been verboten. I want to say that promotion for somebody down the line. I think I lost the question. That's okay. Uh, now, during the Tennessee maneuvers, uh, while you're doing the battle problems and so on, after about five or six weeks, uh, word comes down to get orders to pack up and move to Texas. What do you remember about that? Well, everybody's considered, uh, considering the, the move and for instance there's a three section. We were just saying how many boxes you're gonna need to pack your equipment, what size boxes do they have to be? Uh, who gave me the wrong information? <laughs> and it was just the normal transfer problem. When you go to, same thing when you move overseas. It's a little different, but same kind of training. What do you remember about the move? How did what, how did you get to Camp Barkley? I had trains going to Camp Barkley on the first train, and I was. My train commander out of the first, one of the first trains to Camp Park. We, I couldn't find out from anybody what a train commander was supposed to do when nobody had ever been one. And so we staggered around, I uh, ruptured. Well, this, this uh, General Brewer, it turned out when we get down almost to the view work for those sighting that views. We listed as New Texas, not Abilene. And we had just served dinner. And everybody had to mess here in their lap or somewhere. When the train stopped, and they said, you're here. Well, I had just asked the conductor about when we expected to get in. And he said, oh, well, no need to worry about it. Well, anyway, that, the men weren't happy about having their meal interrupted. And Did they, they not get to finish? Did they just have to get off the train? They had to get off the train, yeah. Yeah, they, when we pulled up there, the band was on one side, the general was over there to welcome them because they were one of the first in there. Well, he, I didn't know there was anything wrong because in the ways of the army, they had put the higher ranking people in the front. I mean, that is what I want to say. Anyway, 
Anyway, they, I had a notice for somebody told me that General wanted to see me, so I went General Brewer, and he hit me about this men not getting their meal, and he, he uh, gave me a the real going over. There was no question about what he meant. I thought he was probably going to skin me alive or throw me into lions or something. But when I left, I never did hear a word about it. So, I mean, he was that kind of guy. He would put on a big front. We thought it would help any. But it really wasn't so tough. He was a t-shirt toddler and a social group. He just didn't drink. But he let his age, let his age get sticks in the drug every day. He was tolerant of more than we expected after seeing him. What was your first impression of Camp Barkley once you saw it? Wasn't very good because they told us, I have no verification, they told us that it had been occupied by medical personnel. Some places had, I suppose. And then there's, I don't know what other divisions had been in there. But the buildings were getting pretty ratty. And, uh, he had a lot of, he, I don't know whether he had any pictures or samples of the four bed hutments. They'd take uh, plywood panels and make a floor, and then two panels on this side with a cutout for a window, two panels on this side with a cutout for Barn type window, sliding window. Same thing on the other side, and a door on the fourth side. And that was pretty. I mean, that beats uh, staying out in the rain. But by the time we got there, uh, the plywood had warped, and uh, it was kind of not as good as. It had brand new stuff on the camp. What do you remember about training at Camp Barclay? Is it any different than what you had uh, uh, undergone in Tennessee or Camp Campbell? Well, my impression was that it was just progressive. In a, it's one, one training program. And what you haven't had is what you get. And there was some individual training done down there, but most of it was unit. They, I don't know too much about that because I, Checked in the, in the Camp Barkley uh, in this combat command. I was executive officer, which meant I get a promotion, except it didn't work that way. And
What do you remember about the uh, maneuvers where the division went to Brownwood, and while the division was gone, inspectors were brought in and inspected the right. camp, and that's where General Brewer got into trouble. What do you remember about that episode? Well, th during this time, I was studying the I mean, I'm battalion, the combat command exec. Uh, I don't think, I don't remember whether I was appointed by orders or whether I just did the job because there was nobody else there. But, you know, we had, one was a night problem. And the headquarters participated when I mean, we were in the and we had one thing they checked on this deal that you're talking about where they inspected things pretty carefully. The uh, impression that people had that were down on the lower level <coughs> was that they uh, Uh, what do you know about uh, General uh, Brewer's relief? Do you remember anything about that? His relationship with General Walker uh, or anything about his relief? Well, his... I know very little about his relief except hearsay, which I think was accurate, but Uh, General Brewer and General Walker, you mentioned together, were pretty much, I'd say, opposites. General Walker was a loud mouth, flamboyant, try to be a tap, tap, tiny guy, and General Brewer was very much have it right. What happened that caused this uh, conflict? In other words, what happened that, that actually triggered the uh, relief? Did it have anything to do with uh, uh, what happened at Camp Barkley, or did it go back to earlier times between the two? I, I think that it went to earlier time. But I just proved it. At Camp Barkley, they based it on what they found then and what they found then. But they are, they did. Well, this is an example. In the companies, we were to move out to the camp out the reservation. We were getting ready to move out. At a little before noon, or about a little afternoon, guess what? Orders came to move out immediately. And Every man must go. So they, I don't know whether every man went or not. I don't, I doubt it very much when you talk about every, every man doing something. You're dreaming usually, but there's always one 
at least one that will miss the boat. Like, rather than misses the boat to come home. And they, so we moved out, and the inspectors came in. I had taken the headquarters company the combat command and we had them billeted in a little circle up there under the cedar bushes. And when they got back into the camp, the inspectors found dirty dishes. Well, that really set them off. And they did find dirty dishes because there wasn't time. You couldn't comply with both orders. You could have all the dishes washed, the man fed, and so then we went on the maneuver. And it was on the next next night or two that. We had a problem where they checked us on digging box and that piece of terrain where you only dig box holes, shallow and, and you, when you can find them, because the soil is so rocky, it's almost impossible to dig a hole. And they kind of know. They skinned us on that and other things too, but all that added up. And I used all that. Yeah. So the inspectors were around for quite some time? It just wasn't a one day inspection then? It could be an inspection. It would have been, I don't know which it was. You had to do it one day. Yeah. Different people do different things. Well, when did you find out that uh, General Brewer had been relieved? How was the uh, staff officers told? No idea. Okay. What about uh, anyone else? I, I think there were some other officers that left with uh, General Brewer. Do you, did you know any of them? Yeah, I know. I knew him at the time. Right now, I don't know. Okay. His chief of staff, Jack Ryan. Uh, getting out, especially the regular personnel. When they saw a move coming, they just hurry around and do a little politicking and see if it wouldn't look a little better. I don't know if that happened there. But, and let's see. Do you know what ever happened to uh, Colonel Ryan after he left Barkley? Uh, no. Not immediately. The next time I knew Ryan was, I mean, the next time I knew about him, I just didn't even see him, uh, was in, well, we came down to Abilene on a vacation one time since, I don't remember which year it was, and on the way back, I stopped Fort Knox and I looked through books to see if there any names I recognized, and General, Colonel Ryan was then a two-star general commanding Army Force. Is that right? So he didn't seem to suffer 
any real long-lasting repercussions from this uh, episode uh, at Camp Barkley. Apparently not. He had, uh, that's all I know. He, he was a two-star general. Well, uh, the uh, training continues on until through the summer of 1944. When do you get word that uh, 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 moving out is imminent? In other words, uh, I guess that would be after uh, Colonel, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, General Alphonse Green uh, assumes command there in August of 1944. Uh, what, what are your duties uh, in getting the uh, command ready for getting on the trains and going to Camp Shanks? Well, I mean, they, <coughs> we all more or less the same thing. We, I were in the G3 section and I involved making sure the packages were supporting the regulations. That our, our stuff was ready on time. And, and proper. I don't think we had any other outside. What do you remember about the train trip across the country up to New York? The only thing, the only thing I remember about that was one group of Probably five or six officers I didn't even know played poker all the way. The whole way. Uh, I don't know whether that all the way means all the way. That you get from conversation and it sometimes is. But Anyway, they had a lot of poker games to go. What did you do at Camp Shanks? I know that there was a small interlude there before you got on the ships. A lot of the men got passes. What did the officers do? What did you do? Went into New York a couple of times. Yes. Just uh, during the day, back in the uh, He did a certain amount of training. He, he trained there, climb rope ladder, and that sort of thing. But That uh, training at Cap Shang was pretty well, as I remember, taken over by Camp Shang. In other words, this rope climbing, we didn't have anybody that was qualified to teach. So it had been organized the other way. That you just show up with the people and they right? Tell me about the voyage over, the ship that you were on, and uh, anything you remember about that time before you get to England. Okay. Uh, we boarded the Empress of Australia. The Empress of Australia was a whole World War One era Both that, according to the stories they told us, at least, was being built for use as a yacht for the Kaiser. And the British took it over after World War I. And they made a. They ran the Vancouver to Australia run. And done that for many years. 
some other side trips, I think. It, uh, one of the men said it hadn't been clean since British had it. Anyway, uh, I used our personnel to clean it up someplace. That didn't leave a very good taste to be wow. They, they used all kinds of things to get more people in. Uh, one of the whole, well, more than one, but one whole had tables, like uh, campground tables, bench, bench on each side. And, uh, Solid top, and then also they had one more. Well, correction, it didn't take it. Anyway, at night, one man slept on each bench, one on top of the table, and one on the floor under the table, and they ate in the same room. And it was a smelly proposition. You couldn't do anything else about it. Uh, they weren't different. Ships may be the same. Same ship. It's a different type, I don't know. But they had different. Uh, different setups for fixing the thing up. We're getting the men trying to get them fed and the we went in a convoy. One of the things you could do was stand on deck and watch the destroyers cutting through it. Chase us up. What were your accommodations like, senior officers? I, I had a, a room. Well, the proper no one played true way. State room, probably. State or cabin. A, state room or cabin. And they, this one had been originally designed, I think, to handle two people. The, the two sides of the, what? There was a house, deck house, and we had six in there. Uh, it had a double. It had a bathtub. It had other equipment was in there. Kind of ratty looking, but of course it's been out a number of years. <coughs> the bathtub, everybody perked up and seeing that. The old, the head British are still serving as cabin boys. Well, um, this, they were old, most of them. This fellow was old. And he's, Bigger than that. That's full of dead bodies. Of everybody knew it, but he, they didn't like to be told that the bath water was full of dead bodies. 
uh, the convoy was scheduled to land at Boulogne, in France, and several things happened. Right? That was Third Army. That's stalled up on the Moselle River because they were short of everything. And George wanted everything. So they decided that the biggest source of Personnel there. This was equipment, tanks, guns, and so on. That he was short of, so they split our convoy in three parts, and two of them. Correction. The convoy was split. The only thing that went on to alone, and they were a little ahead time-wise, was the advance detachment, which was the general, by this time General Allen, and uh, some of the other staff officers, some of them had been, I think they were seeing somebody left from kind of brewer staff, I'm not sure. But some of General Green's staff, because they always bring part of their staff with them. And They were staff members from different organizations, had been in different organizations, came up. And they went on to go. The rest of the convoy, all of us, that part was split in three. One of them was one section that I was in, was ordered into Liverpool. Another one went into Bristol, and another one into Southampton. And they land them. Well, of course, they kept their movement secret to the fact that there's a war around it. When they got in, uh, the jobs people did sometimes were hard to see. The G3s had been ordered somewhere else, and the general and his smallest group was over on the continent, and there was Jim Tyree, the assistant G4, and me, the G3 heir. You know, if it's going to run, you got to run. You have all these special officers that come, like the signal officer, the chemical warfare, or they all have more rank, but they knew nothing about the situation going on. So we had to kick that along. We landed and 
proceeded on up to uh, what was that? On the first airborne camp. Hundred first airborne was then fighting at Holland. They made that airdrop uh, in Holland. They were over there except the morning, morning report section, things of that kind of event. So they put us in there just to have a place. All this was was a barbed wire enclosed area that's made in a runway. We came in there trying to get to who was in charge. There were two men there in charge, two captains. They had been, they had been brought in from their civilian life, they were fishermen on Lake Erie. But they, they went in service, they were put in command of harbor boat companies. Well, at that point, apparently, there ain't no harbor boat companies. So they were put in charge of this can camp the airborne and there's nothing there but space here comes a third of a division and they want to eat and sleep and these two guys did a wonderful job we had to go through and pick out light bulbs to put in the socket and this sort of thing but everybody got fed Promptly. Then from there we went by rail. That's just our section now. By rail down through Reading to a place called, well, I was hungry for first, but Tidworth Barracks, which was a British Army post. We were settled in there because then when we found out that we turned our tanks over to the Third Army, they sent them up front, and we were to get new ones back in England, which we did get new ones back in England, but the new ones had 76 millimeter guns as opposed to the men that trained on 75s, so we had to train all the gunners, and that included everybody practically on, on the troop level. We had to stay there, and it took just about a month to take care of them all. And we crossed the channel in on various mostly trains down on the south coast of England, uh, or from Bournemouth, I forgot the name of the area, there's a, a little projection that made it comparatively easy to fire tank gun out over the ocean without hitting the ship. It's the British sort of Pretty good idea to not hit the ships. <laughs> so they we went down to that area, shipped out of there across the channel, and arrived on on the main continent of Europe on November the 11th, 
the French women and children were out in the streets, in many cases waving American flags. So, as we said, that looks like a, quite an occupation. And I said, no, that only happens at the Armistice Day, and that's a French holiday too. Now, what the hell do you have? What about the landing at La Havre? Uh, do, you, do you remember uh, the uh, landing craft that you were on and uh, what yeah. happened when you got to La Havre? It happened, uh, yeah, we got, uh, we were on a landing ship tank, LST, and we, uh, Kind of collect these things. They haven't been collected for quite a while. Was it at night? Did you have any problems with the landing itself? No, no problem. As far as we were concerned, we pulled up on what they call the hards, which is a, you know, I say a brick, like a brick, uh, like a brick road, but it's it's the slope of the on the north side of the. River and the harbor, and we had uh, there wasn't any problem with the landing, they just pulled up there with. It. And dropped the door and the vehicle moved out. Now you link up with General Allen, the advanced detachment. What do you do in the way of setting up operations for your shop? Very little. Uh, obviously the train, the Table of organization, a new one, the new division, won't work. It can't work because they took a section where they had four people working and cut it to one. Well, so we'll, they, they, we'll stop here for a second. Uh -huh. Okay, let's pick up the uh, story. You've landed in France. Uh, we're talking about uh, the new organization and your duties. Uh, what's your impression of General Allen, the new general? General Allen as we saw him was uh, not a Brilliant tactician or anything like that kind. In fact, you didn't uh, get to be a tactician very much in that war. Uh, he's a nice guy, he couldn't find a nice guy. And he tended to take things easy. Some Some um, question came up. He is inclined to just solve it the easy way, and I go get a fine job. I think. What about the French people? What was what was your experience uh, uh, with the French people as you uh, moved into France, uh, deeper and deeper? Well. It, we don't know too much because you know, speaking of French people or anybody was forbidden. 
but they wanted to be sure, I guess, wouldn't talk to any spies, so they just put everybody in. But They were, uh, very nice, that I saw, but I saw probably less of French people than a lot of people, I mean, you know. What about, uh, in terms of combat, What's your memories of the Battle of Hurlesheim? Well, Hurlesheim, I... Uh, let me fill in some of this stuff you have to know. Um, we came from England across the channel, went into an assembly area, along the Seine River there, near La Harpe. And just about got there two or three times, I mean, two or three days. Maybe not that much, I don't know. Um, and we were ordered to southeast France. Form up in column your normal uh, motor column and a jeep with a sign, follow me, pulls out in front and you take off. And you get down there and the jeep would run out of gasoline. Another one comes in and takes him. And that, they led us down to Lunaville. Lunaville as a, a fort, we should call it, that was, that was French and that was German, and it was U.S. because that's in the area where we used to say, and I think it's true, that the people that lived over there kept a, Flag set. They put out a white flag, or a German flag, or a U.S. flag, whatever they saw coming down the road. They, and I just done the same thing because that's a scary place. Now, for the same. Uh, you have to picture the thing like it lays on a map. Because if you come down the Rhine, on the west, west side of the Rhine, right there is a. Uh, I don't know, I have to get a map. Uh, but just off the Rhine, there's a is that is that German officer's map? No, I won't show it. Well, that we may may be interested in that, but. Well, we don't need to have that detail, I guess. Right. But, um, let's see if we get where we left off today. What was your impression of uh, the intelligence reports that were coming in that? Uh, uh, Hurlesheim was lightly defending. Uh, do you remember anything about that uh, on the eve or before the uh, division was yeah. committed? On the, the division, uh, you know, about the time it was committed, 
And that's where I'd have to, to be entirely fair, I'd have to do some research again because things happen in various ways. We were ordered to take a section of the river, Rhine River. Germans didn't have a whole lot on the west side of the river. But they had, what they had was first class. So they, Hertlersheim was just off the Rhine, front, west of the Rhine. And there was a canal that went across almost parallel to the Rhine. It was out here in the flats. It was flat. Over on there, as you looked at it then from our end of the war, you were looking at Furlesheim over on your left and forward. Uh, over to the right, a French held a fight, a search light. That combat command B, I don't know very little about this. Combat Command B was sent to take that piece of real estate there. And they didn't do it. They can't. I can say, that's too tough. And that's when General Allen, I think, said, are you sure? Well, comes the next day and the next evening. Uh, this road perpendicular to the Ryan that comes out there. It has two towns on it, more than that, but two that we're concerned with. Uh, one the uh, all the yeah, I lost what it's called. Brumath and Hawksville and, and I don't know one is a little town and one is a bigger and they're on that road. We were in the, the one that uh, we were in the way we were supposed to be, more or less. We had the G3 air section. I didn't mention the G3 air and the new TO was, was one that hadn't been on in the old. And he had two enlisted men, which he didn't need at all. So that was easily worked out. The G3 section had the needs. We had a person that could sit in there Take care of them. CCB didn't take that, and that made the Corps Commander General Milburn unhappy. And he set up a storm, and how much he said to General Allen, I don't know. But he wouldn't have done. So then the, even the Army Commander. 
got in it. Or doing that. Well, what did General Allen do once uh, the Corps commander uh, well, that's, became unhappy? That's what I'm kind of... Some other officers came up. I don't know who was there, but along this road in this building, there's a schoolhouse, a brick schoolhouse. It's right on the road, like everything is over there. Close. And then on, there's also a nice house on the road. Well, uh, we were installed in this basement of this forward house, which has A parking lot out by it. There must have been something like a beauty shop or something. And we were going into the night. We, were, we had people on these outfits. They. We had in the air, T3 air section. The one thing I always did by our organization, you had a, you'd get a half track with high powered radios and a crew of Army headquarters troops that would be attached. My crew, which was half track on this man, uh, as I told you, there's a way to put those people in where you need them instead of where they are. And they did that and it left me without transportation. So they, somebody told me. This was still back over in England. We had vehicles stored over there. To keep them. They had lots of three-quarter ton trucks, so I could get a three-quarter ton truck to use with practically no sweat, and that's what. We had, then when we operated as, a, as the air section was supposed to do, we would the thing that the organizers had in mind apparently was a, a request for air. Joe down here in the mud, and he, he sees some, some you know, important point, and he gets his radio, and, but he, didn't, he can't carry a radio that would do that in those days. Different frequencies, air, ground. Well, we had a 
We had changed the table of organization a little bit. The You would, according to them, take that, our section would take that process of, by taking it over to the core air officer, and he would send his request to the airstrike to the army, and they'd send the thing to arm uh, air those that were they were sam troops. They sent it on for or uh, what kind of air cover did you call in at Hurlshine from uh, Corps? I can't answer that at all, Pat. Okay. I had heard of time now. We talk about the first day. You don't hear much about it. But that's when the CCB went up there and got the heck slapped on them. And General I'm losing them faster. Anyway, they were, they'd been up there once. So we had to go, the command post was moving up this road, at our part of it, and we got up to the town. I think it was, well, I don't know which of those two hands I gave you. But the general, took the room in, in the basement, have his command, his forward most element, which was fine. They had quite a bit of other space in the basement that they could use for the liaison officers to wait, because they always wait. Now, was this General Allen or one of the combat command generals? That was the command, combat command general first. And General Allen had taken this room and that. Uh, and we had a system in the P3 air section, not wanting to get dirty or anything. We remote this radios in on the SCR 522 for communication with the aircraft and also the SCR 300 to communicate back to core. And we, they remote them on a pair of headphones in an ammunition box and we just carried the ammunition box. Uh, we were right outside the door. And the general was in like this door, and we'd be just inside the door and all that. Yeah. We had that set up, and we uh, we weren't doing this. We'd been third hour band, so how they did. And there's another thing, too. Uh, a core or any other officer listen to the radio can't tell whether it's you or you that's speaking. So we could substitute occasionally. In fact, one period of time, I, they said we had a sergeant that was the best forward controller in the ETO. But he, 
Well, anyway, they were conducting business as usual, and General General said, liaison officer, one of them at this time was that bowling hacksaw that's here. Have a story of him, and his story is good as far as I don't know. He was a liaison officer, and there's another fellow. He had two. Well, then a, a, the general pulled up there and one of the generals, I don't know which one. Uh, I don't know why they were getting ahead. It was getting dark, you know. Uh, I, they had the order of things mixed up. There were some good accounts of early time written up. And they issued the order to attack the second day where General is supposed to have said to General Allen, I'm going to try that one more time. You know, get on the ball and get out there and take that away from those few old men and uh, so on. Uh, that I don't know about. But I know they were still arguing, apparently. Apparently, General Allen was still objecting. To he was... He took that and got us all set up. I got the radio set up and it was operating. So I went across the street to his house where they were using the parking lot and using the house too. And I know they told me you can sleep in there. Is what they ordinarily do is. But, well, I went in, I just did sleep a little bit, I think, but I found the bed was still warm. Maybe <laughs> they were, had to run somebody out, I guess. But up, upstairs now, or up. These three years on us, one of them, the other one was Hexel, and the other one was uh, Kentucky and Fulana, Little Bird, Kentucky. Anyway, they reported. The chief of staff was in there, you could hear him. Uh, and of course, we, were, we thought we were doing very well. They, they, General Milburn and I don't know who the generals were. That's, uh, actually, so about the combat maybe, command A. That's General Adams. Right. It was not him. No, it was not him. General Allen was. He, General Adams was combat command commander. 
when I was executive officer, and he was, he was, uh, peculiar kind of guy, in a way you didn't know whether it was really safe. But one time, he kept me, I suppose it's the house, but over hours after supper, to write up a problem, he'd keep dealing with you. And he said, why don't you go home? That's very important anyhow. Then you'd be in the boil. But he was also another thing. He was pretty much by the book. But he was by the book to the extent that this that Haxel wrote about could happen. When higher headquarters or something, he pretty much going to do it, whether it makes any sense or not. And that's what They got the order that they came up with, Carlos John Moore, is uh, assigned one, well, one on the group, troops to go in on the left, a little up front, and bring the other. Around the side.